this week on Life and Faith. So the sun would set at the end of May and not come back to mid-August. You get up, it's dark. You go to work, it's dark. You have lunch, it's dark. You go out for an afternoon stroll, it's dark. You come in the evening, it's dark. It's a very strange experience. On any count, Paul is one of the most significant human beings who ever lived. It's a mystery even in science, so why wouldn't people be open to other mysteries? In some ways, the drive is even stronger in people that have had difficult childhoods. I'd recommend it to anybody. Welcome to Life and Faith from CPX. I'm Simon Smart. I'm Justine Toe. What does it feel like to be completely isolated and yet also living among others in very close proximity to you? I'm thinking of submarines and places like this, but do you get cabin fever? Do people get on each other's nerves? Tempers get raised? And if you have to be around the same people day in and day out, do you wind up working a way of living well with each other? See, it's funny, Simon, because you went to submarine. I went straight to lockdown. (laughs) And I want to say that if you're thinking about lockdown, then you're half right. Because as it turns out, that experience that you're talking about is a small glimpse of life as a winterer in Antarctica, someone who lives and works on Antarctica over the long, dark winter months. It might be my great fear of submarines, Justine. It's sort of a nightmare for me. But today we're bringing you Justine's chat with Alex Gaffigan. Now, these days, Alex is a heritage consultant, but 24 years ago, she spent two and a half years on Antarctica as a meteorologist for Halley Research Station on the Brunt Ice Shelf. And while she had a lot to say about life in Antarctica, Alex had even more to say about what it means to live well with other people and be a good friend slash colleague slash housemate slash neighbour to them as well, especially when things seem kind of bleak. But first up, Alex gives us a fascinating glimpse into life in Antarctica. Originally from South London, where she grew up, it took months to travel to Antarctica. So what were her first impressions of the place? Well, I went down by ship, so I went on the um, the Bransfield, the RRS Bransfield, and it took about nine weeks to get to Antarctica. By the time I arrived on the Brunt High Shelf, we'd already visited a few sub-Antarctic islands and travelled, gosh, for a few weeks through sea ice and seen a lot of Antarctica. So kind of by the time we arrived, I was almost used to the cold a bit, uh, but it was still quite a shock to land on the Brunt Ice Shelf where it's basically flat white ice as far as the eye can see. And is it true that because there's not necessarily other things around you except ice, that it's hard to get a sense of the sorts of distances that you're seeing? Is that right? That's correct, yes, because there's really, well, where we were, there's not much in the distance. It's just ice (laughs) for kilometres and kilometres. So um, no mountains, no trees, no nothing in the distance. So it felt quite, um, it's like being at sea, I guess, as well, you know, with that sense of just blue as far as as the eye can see. But this was just ice everywhere. Now, Alex soon became accustomed to daily life at Halley Research Station, meteorological observations several times a day, and often covering someone else's work as well. She lived alongside and worked with 16 other winterers, and often pitched in because life there just depends on it. It was very well organised. So we all had a job to do. We knew what we were doing. So, uh, for example, we had a chef on base who would cook for us, but we also helped out on every Sunday we'd take it in turns to to cook. Somebody was always on what we called gash, which meant that we had to do the cleaning and tidying for a week um, or be on night shift, for example, and spend all night being awake just to check that the base wasn't going to be set on fire or anything like that. And then there was sort of lots of activities we also organised to sort of, you know, get to know each other and lots of crafting activities because there's nothing there's no shops down there there's nothing to buy you know if you want to get somebody a present you can't go to a shop so you've got to make the present or make the cars so there was a lot of sort of knitting and carpentry and (laughs) card making all that sort of thing um, which was fun and when you mention crafting I hate to be so cliche about it but maybe these are more things that you might have been interested in. Were there other women no, on board? No, oh, no. Really? So, so there were 16 winterers and in my first year there was two women, in the second winter three women, but the crafting went across the whole board. I mean, there was really not much else to do. So every, all of us, all of us would, I don't know, do like particularly because at midwinter we'd have a big celebration so everybody would make a present like a sort of secret santa for each other guys and girls would spend hours days weeks making games uh, out of wood or sculptures or 
I don't know, um, you know, just sewing things, you know, it was amazing, actually, you know, it was a lovely activity because there wasn't any television when I was there. We did have the odd, we had the odd movie night, but really we sort of self-regulated ourselves not to spend all day in front of the telly, you know, because that would be boring. And instead we got all crafty instead. Oh, how fascinating. I also, um, I believe you were there before broadband internet as well, yeah. right? I mean, I believe now even it needs to be satellite generated. So it's not as though people can go and stream all, all mm-hmm. evening if they want to. <laughs> um, but that also has its own implications as well, doesn't it? As in, you wouldn't necessarily have easy access to friends and family that's right. We, with them. If I remember rightly, we had um, we had an email schedule sort of once or twice a day, and there was a limit to the number of um, messages you could send. So you know, I, we used to just write a few emails, and then they would be sent, you know, once or twice a day. So that was pretty. Um, and then you get the responses, maybe one or two emails a day. Uh, we had a phone. We did have a satellite phone which you could use, but it was so expensive that we I used it on you know high days and holidays and, uh, and when it was sort of Christmas and things. Um, and then, of course, there was post, but the post would only arrive, say, once or twice a year, usually around December and then again in February when the ships or planes would come in. Uh, so you get a big stack of posts that everyone has sent you all in one go. But but otherwise, that was about it, really, for, for contact with the outside world. Oh, gosh. And there's a long winter stuck in the middle of that too, right? So February to... October is winter and That's, yeah. I don't know how how did you deal with the cold as well, as well as the isolation on top of that but the cold you know. well everyone always asks me about the cold but actually the cold wasn't the big problem because to be highly frank if you're getting cold in Antarctica something is going to go horribly wrong you know bits of your body are going to start dropping off so they issued us with very good clothing and inside the buildings it was lovely and warm and in fact we even went camping out at minus 30 minus 35 yes, that was I fine I want to ask you that yeah that was fine but what, like the, the, how how is it fine <laughs> it's not fine you, you just wear a lot of clothes and then we would you know the, I mean the the tents were pretty serious and you know you'd have a ground sheet mats uh, wooden boards uh, you'd have a you know a five season sleeping bag a uh, fleece line is the sleeping bag, a canvas bag with a sleeping bag. And we would also have, for example, a primer stove and a tilly lamp going in the tent. So you could warm it up quite well. Um, so the cold wasn't a problem. It was the dark that was <laughs> the oh, problem. Okay. So the sun, where we were, the sun would set at the end of uh, at the end of May and not come back to mid-August. So you'd have a couple of months there without seeing the sun. And that just sent us all bananas. Really, yeah, because, well, tell us, tell us what yeah. that does to you. Like, I mean, obviously there's um, circadian rhythms get mm, completely mm. smashed. Yeah. But there, are there also um, psychological, maybe even spiritual impacts of not seeing the sun, living in darkness? I would say definitely. They'd, in fact, they were doing some sort of tests on us when we were down there to see if they could counteract it with very bright lights and that kind of thing. Because they found that people did get more lethargic. You don't sleep as well. Uh, you get more worried about things, more... Um, I don't know, just down about the stuff, you know, um, that was the hardest bit really. And and then you feel you feel a lot more sort of isolated as well. And these are all sort of psychological impacts, I think, of that sort of sad syndrome or whatever it is, you know, where... Oh, seasonal where you, affective yeah. disorder, that thing. Yeah, where yeah. you don't get to see the sun for, for two months. And then, of course, in the, but in the summer, you'd have 24 hours of daylight and then it'd be like, woo, <laughs> <laughs> plenty of energy, plenty of time, plenty of things to do. Uh, but the dark in the winter was the hardest, definitely. And, 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 and the thing I found the hardest to cope with, I suppose, is that is that you know that you, you get an extra sense of being remote, a bit away from your family, away from normality, um, and just struggling to sort of you get up, it's dark, you go to work, it's dark, you have lunch, it's dark, you go out for an afternoon stroll, it's dark, you come in the evening, it's dark. It's it's a very strange experience. The dark. Well, we'll come back to that a bit later, but let's wind back a bit. When Alex was first interviewed about this job, her prospective employers didn't know what to do about her Christian faith, which popped up in a reference or two to a church choir or Christian-based organisations. If she got the job, was her faith going to become an issue? I remember when I applied for the job, I was about 21, 22, and I went to the interview and I sat there and I remember them, uh, they ask you all lots of personal questions because you're not just going down there to work, you're going down there to live. And one of the questions they said was, we, we can see your faith is very important to you. Is this a kind of, do you feel it's important to go share your faith with others? <laughs> I was like, crikey, they, they think I'm going to go down and be sort of proselytizing, you know, <laughs> to all my fellow winterers. Um, so I said, no, no, you know, I, you know, I'm, you know, obviously my 
faith is important, but I'm not going to go and try and convert everybody <laughs> to, to Christianity. And I could have left it at that, but then I thought, but that's not really being honest to who I am. So I said, but, <laughs> but I said, through, through being, a, being a Christian, I suppose, I tried to live the golden rule of loving your neighbour as yourself. And I said to them, you know, for me, Christianity is important in the sense of trying to love my neighbour. But And I think that would be helpful, you know, when I go to Antarctica to try and love my fellow winterers and, you know, care for them. And I said, you know, so it is important to me and I, I hope it will actually make me a better winterer, you know. And um, it was very interesting because there was a sort of pause, like little crumbs, <laughs> by, you know, what have I said? And then actually it turned out the head of HR, in fact, went, well, this is very interesting. Interesting. He said, he said, I've just read an article about this. And he rubbled around in his desk and he pulled out a magazine with an article from a, a doctor, I think, who'd been at an American base who had talked about really kind of rediscovering spirituality and faith in Antarctica. So he was telling me about this. I thought, this, this interview has gone in an unusual direction. And I later found out, in fact, that actually one of the other interviews um, was a dedicated parishioner at um, Great St. Mary's in Cambridge, in fact. And his vicar was my old vicar. So that was a funny coincidence. So rather, I found. I found in the end that rather than sort of being a hindrance, I suppose, or a sort of something you might look down on, that actually having that kind of, um, you know, I suppose, you're trying to live the golden rule of loving your neighbour as yourself was actually something that I think helped me to get the job, which was good. And how did that play out once you were at Halley Research Station? Oh, well, yes, they were all very nervous when I turned up as well. That I was going to be a kumbaya scene. But, you know... It's quite funny, actually, because, I mean, you know, I mean, I didn't go around sort of proselytising things, but like we had Christmas carols on the ship and stuff. So, you know, it wasn't that we were wholly, you know, not um, religious at all. And, you know, there's quite a few religious, you know, discussions about spirituality and things. Again, I wasn't proselytising, but but I really felt it was my my job but down in Antarctica to try and to love my neighbour. I'm a member of, a, if, I mean, I'm Anglican, but it's a, there's a Catholic organisation called Focolari. And one of the things they talk about there is, is trying to, to, you know, to love your neighbour and to be the first to love, love your enemies, love you, you know, you know, they really emphasize those words from the gospel. So I really tried to do that and tried to, for example, you know, if somebody was cleaning up, I might go and give them a hand or, you know, if people are having an argument, not take sides, not try to gossip too much, cleaning um, tablecloths and laying them out for dinner, you know, little small things, I think, that are sort of make you the sort of stone that has ripples that sort of, you know, expand across. And because there was only 16 people, when you try to love and you, you get loved in return, that mutual love, you know, it sort of really helps. And I think that the atmosphere on base really was sort of, you know, improved and elevating things by just me trying to love the other, not just me, but, you know, me like trying to love the others, them, you know, responding, loving each other. I think it made a, a big difference. And in fact, I know it did because, because they gave you a medal at the end of it all. Oh, what? <laughs> so it was quite funny. I I was awarded the Fuchs Medal. The citation says for Met, for Meteorology, and for Morale. And I like to think the morale, in fact, is the sort of secular word for sort of trying to, to build unity, for trying to love one's neighbour. So um, I think it's something that gets recognised by the wider world, you know, if you really try to live that in your daily life. You know? At the same time, I'm sure that even if small acts of kindness help to contribute to morale, that the pressure of living in the dark, as you've been saying, and with 16 others, there were going to be frictions within the community as well. How did those get negotiated, especially living in such close quarters with other people? Um, you know, there was always horror stories <laughs> going around down of winters where folks went bad and cliches formed and all this sort of thing. But actually, the two years that I was there, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, there was the odd bickering, but... You can't sustain that because it's not like you, you you can't escape from people. You know, you, you might have a row with somebody in the lounge in the evening, but you're going to see them at breakfast. You're going to see them at lunch. You're going to see them in the bar after work. You're going to go on holiday with them. You're going to work together. So really, you know, major arguments weren't sustained. And in fact, the two years that I was there, there was actually very little. <laughs> that was my disagreement. When people came back in the summer, they they remarked upon it. I remember one of the, um, the engineers who'd come in with the planes came in and said, you know, when you arrive there, you never know what you're going to find. You know, what's sort of state everyone's in. He said it was remarkable that, well, certainly the years that I was there, that, that there was remarkably little friction uh, down there, which was good, which is good, you know. You're listening to Life and Faith from CPX, and we're hearing about Alex Gaffigan's time on Antarctica as a meteorologist. 
Now, most of us will never get to visit Antarctica. So Justin wanted to ask her about the environment and the adventure of living in such a wild and dangerous place. Here's Alex. I suppose it's dangerous in the sense that, you know, there are crevasses and, you know, there's sea ice you can fall through and the weather can, you know, pick up snow at a moment's notice and, uh, and restrict your visibility so that you can't see very far. So you had to be very careful when you went outside. You had to wear enough clothes, tell people where you're going, carry a radio, follow uh, drum lines or rope lines so that you didn't get lost. But then once you got used to it, you know, you could go out and we would go on trips and things. And um, we would travel down to the coast where the coast, <laughs> the, coast the edge of the uh, Bront Ice Shelf. So we were living on a glacier, <laughs> essentially. We would camp by the edge of the glacier and sometimes abseil or walk down to the sea ice, which in winter what? was... Um, You're abseiling down to the yeah, sea ice. to okay. the sea ice. And right. it was, a, I suppose, about sort of, I don't know, 50 foot up. Um mm. Then, then we could walk around in the sea ice, which was a couple of meters thick. You know, it wasn't going anywhere. And we'd visit the emperor penguin colony, which would live near us. And that was tremendous. I mean, they were just there were sort of thousands of birds. They're all sort of huddled together, keeping warm. And in spring, you'd go down and see the emperor, emperor penguins, which would have eggs or chicks on their feet, you know. And um, that was great. And it was nice as well because it felt like you were back in the crowds because <laughs> I missed crowds. Of, <laughs> you know, we were all, there was only 16 of us. So it was just like we were a bit bored of each other. So it was great to meet new people, even though they were penguins. <laughs> um, we, we saw the odd whale as well, um, particularly in spring when the sea ice would melt, whales would come up and see those. And then on base, sometimes we'd get the odd penguin visiting us on the research station and birds, petrels and, and sort of little birds would come up and see us as well. I think they were just curious to see what was going on. Not a tremendous amount of life. That was pretty much it. No plants, nothing where we were, there was no land and we couldn't see anything in the, in the ocean. It was too deep. So it was mainly birds that we saw. Well, I do believe that you've spoken about getting woken up in the middle of the night by the person who was on watch and being told to come outside and look at the southern lights. Like that's pretty special, surely, is, as well. Yeah, yeah the, um, the Aurora Australis um, particularly happened, I mean, obviously you couldn't see it in summer, it was 24 hours of daylight, but from autumn through to spring, we'd get the most dramatic light shows. And sometimes it would just be a sort of dull green kind of colour on the edge of the horizon. But sometimes you'd get woken up in the middle of the night, you'd go outside and it was just going bananas. There would be white, pinks, green, sort of floaty kind of things, sort of, it's very hard to explain, but but it's sort of, it's totally silent, of course, because it's happening, you know, thousands, tens of thousands of you know, metres up in the air. So it's totally silent, but just this amazing sort of vivid kind of light show for you. Uh, wonderful, really. Does it get quite spooky and, I guess, spiritual? And you're already a person of belief as well. Does it start to hit home for you then? Because, you know, there's no electric light or, or not not much electric light going on to obscure your kind of... Um, view of the cosmos and you're seeing this incredible light show you're in this quite barren to some degree place but do people's thoughts kind of stray upward at that point and start thinking about the bigger questions I suppose oh definitely and I mean obviously Aurora was amazing but just just the Milky Way is amazing I'd never seen it before. I grew up in London where the light pollution <laughs> just obscures everything. This is the first time I'd ever seen the band, the band of stars that stretches across the sky. And there are stars in other spaces, but it's very, very distinctive. And it was the first time I'd ever seen that. And I would sometimes I'd be walking back between buildings and I would just stop and look up. And you just felt tiny, you know, looking at this immense universe well not even the universe it's just a galaxy you know although you can see other little galaxies as well but you know just this immense galaxy of stars and you felt tiny and you felt it sort of almost vertiginous you know that you could fall into space and sort of I don't know just is an immensity that I suppose that makes you feel quite um it's small but also lucky lucky that you can stand there and just look out over this sort of gorgeous you know, view. And I used to imagine that, you know, on other planets out there in the world, there are some other alien versions of Alex looking back at me and, you know, <laughs> imagine what's out there, you know, what's, um, you know, where am I in my world? As you can hear from Alex, that beautiful wild place can also be terrifying and intimidating and perhaps unsurprisingly throws up some existential questions for some of the people living there. In her second year, Alex found herself experiencing a dark night of the soul. I remember my second winter in particular finding it very hard 
and finding myself feeling very down and very in the isolation, the darkness, and almost, you know, also feeling a bit lost, you know, too, in terms of sort of, I suppose, my own spirituality as well. And I remember, I guess the thing had been that up until I went to Antarctica, my life had been very um, normal <laughs> in the sense of, you know, family life, school, university. I, you know, been to church. I hadn't really challenged myself, I suppose, in the sense of put, taking myself out of my comfort zone. And then I went to Antarctica and, and yeah, by the second winter, I was really, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't been able to go to church for a while. I hadn't had sort of that regular input of normal spiritual life, I guess. And I suppose I'd, I'd really started to doubt, you know, everything that I'd ever thought of because I was actually questioning and challenging for the first time in my life. And I remember thinking, you know, what if there's no God? What if, you know, <laughs> what if it's all just made up? What if, what if just really, I felt this, you know, sense of loss, massive loss, I suppose. And then I remember just one night, I remember crying a lot. And then I woke up the next morning and I think, I remember thinking to myself, okay, Alex, you've pulled the carpet from underneath you. You know, what do you actually believe? What do you, what can you concrete hand on your heart say you believe in? And I thought to the life that I've been trying to live of trying to, as I said, trying to love my neighbor. And, you know, I mean, Jesus uh, had, had some really good instructions there. You know, he said, you know, when I was when I was in prison, did you visit me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was naked, did you clothe me? Very practical suggestions for, you know, loving one's neighbor. And I'd really tried to put that into practice. And the funny thing is, because there was only 16 of us, I could see, I could see a difference. I could see that you make a difference. If you um, forgive, you try to love, you try to help people, it makes a difference. In day-to-day life, it's very hard to notice that. You know, often we do kind things to each other. We try to love our neighbours. And then you don't see them for two days a week. You know, you, you don't see the impact. But in Antarctica, I could see the impact. I could see that people were happy. I could see that people were appreciative that it changed the atmosphere on base and, you know, the, the ripples were expanding. So for me, this was almost like this was evidence, I suppose. This was proof. This was proof that trying to put those those words into practice, trying to live that in my daily life actually made a difference. It made other people happy. It made me happy. And I thought to myself, if I, if I know nothing else, then I know that if I try to to put those words, of those, those recommendations, you know, guidelines, I suppose, from Jesus there into practice in my life, then it makes a difference. It works. It works. And I held on to that. And I thought, that's my evidence. That's my rock. And it stuck with me for the rest of my life. You know, it, faith comes, faith goes. Sometimes I felt close to God, sometimes I don't. But still that, you know, that actions, those moments where I can say, you know, I've really gone above and beyond to try and, you know, be the first to love, to love my neighbor, to love everyone. Those moments actually make a difference. And so, um, and I credit, you know, that was Antarctica that gave me that sort of crisis, but also I suppose the the proof <laughs> that, the kindness works. Mm-hmm. In a strange way, all that Alex learned about loving her neighbour in the isolation of Antarctica wound up helping her through lockdown some 20 years later. Look, I suppose I hadn't really thought about it that much until until we went into isolation, I must admit. And I thought, gosh, I, I know how to cope with this. <laughs> I've done this for two years. So that helped, I suppose. I wasn't afraid of being alone or being isolated. or um, I know how to cope with those challenges and... And I'd also say my my faith has been stronger since then and my commitment, I suppose, to loving my neighbour has been stronger. I've never lost that. I never lost that knowledge that actually I can make a difference. The actions of trying to love my neighbour, sort of almost putting myself to one side, emptying myself and really just thinking of the other. I found that worked in Antarctica. You know, if I, if I was feeling down or upset, I would just put my own feelings to one side and just go out and do something, do something positive to help other people. That could be going to the kitchen and making some nice food. You know, it could be cleaning something up. It could be just checking on somebody else, you know. And I found those little actions of trying to care for others, to love others, just sort of worked, you know, because when you're thinking about other people and, you know, you're not you're not dwelling, worrying about your own situation. Well, certainly for me, that was my, my experience. And again, in isolation, in, you know, lockdown, putting yourself in that situation where you're worrying about yourself and your own thoughts and your own life, it can get you down. You can sort of spiral down into sort of, um, I don't know, feeling just lost, really. And again, I just, I don't even worry about these things. I'm lost. I feel upset. I feel lonely. I feel whatever. Don't worry about it. I'm just going to get up, go out or not go, out, or go on the internet and just try to help others. And so, for example, during isolation, on Mondays, I've been going to um, 
evening prayer and Christian meditation at church. Of course, during lockdown, I couldn't go anymore. So one of the organizers said to me, well, look, you know, she wasn't particularly internet savvy. So she said, look, I've heard about this kind of Zoom thing, you know. Could the... So I said, that's fine. Yes, yes, we could we could just shift it all on Zoom. So um, I started to um, organize, uh, you know, the email lists and and organize the Zoom meetings. So instead of going to church and having evening prayer meditation, we, we went on to Zoom. I mean, it was, everyone was so appreciative and so happy because it helped them to not feel so isolated and, and lost and kept up routines, which is also super important. So I just transferred all the things I did in real life onto the internet. And that kind of you know, organizing drinks and dinners, but just all on Zoom or on the internet, just so that it stopped me thinking about myself and actually just made me love. And I find by actually just doing those actions, by just trying to help others, that actually ultimately reflects back on me. And I feel better anyway. I feel more happy. I feel like I'm, I suppose I'm just sort of taking all those worries to one side and just focusing on others. Helps, but helps in Antarctica, helps during isolation. I found an interview where you said this. You said, I was in this place with no formal worship, Mm -hmm. no church, no vicars, but I said, I can see God everywhere. Mm -hmm. Can you just lift the veil on that (laughs) for me and just just give me one sense of how you saw God everywhere? Because I could see God. God for me is love. God is love. Love is God. So when I was down there, I saw God in my neighbour. You know, they, many of them weren't Christians, crikey, <laughs> you know, but but still I saw God in them. I saw Jesus in them. I saw that through, you know, through love, a mutual love, that God is there, God is present, you know, and that really when you live mutual love, you can create heaven, a little bit of heaven <laughs> on earth because it's something that you all have to do together. And as I said, most, you know, most of the folks there weren't Christians at all. You know, some had a spirituality and um, and shared that with me, which is lovely. But But God was really there in our relationships, I suppose, and through the love that everyone had and the kindness that they had for each other. You know, I, I don't want to give away too much, but one of my friends when I'd arrived, he was he was quite notorious because he'd made this dinner the year before where he'd um I think he'd just done beans on toast or something like that. <laughs> but you know, I tried to build a relationship with him, become friends and, you know, and with everybody else as well. And in for example, in, in my first year, he then he became friends, very good friends with another uh, member of the base. And they were on cooking duty and ended up creating this feast, a feast of Indian food. And I thought this is a concrete difference between somebody who feels sad, isolated, depressed, you know, and just wants to do the job to the bottom of the rung, you know. But through love and kindness and friendship, suddenly, you know, we'll spend all day cooking and preparing a feast for everybody, not just for one person, but everybody, you know. And that's God. That's God to me. That is love. That is you know, a tangible seeing of God in others. He wouldn't wouldn't probably say that himself, but that's how I see it. You've been listening to Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart and Justine Toe. Thank you so much to Alex for such a wonderful chat about her life in Antarctica and how what she learned came in handy, strangely enough, 20 years later. Now, is winter getting you down as it is me? Yes, yes, 100% yes. <laughs> well, if so, why not pass on this episode to someone you know and love your neighbour in that way. Next week. Knowledge isn't this information dump. If you want reality to graciously self-disclose to you, it's kind of like a marriage. you got to promise to love, honour and obey first. So if you want to become a pianist, how many hours do you have to spend in position on the piano bench?